Cannabis Health Radio. I'm Ian Jessup. And I'm Corey Elland. Today we're talking to a man who had hepatitis C from a tainted blood transfusion after a motorbike accident and a number of years later was diagnosed with fatal cirrhosis of the liver. But he started taking cannabis oil and today he's alive and well and here to tell us his story. And joining us from all places, Transylvania is Steve Danks, who is a hemp activist and radio show host for Time for Hemp Network. Steve, good to talk to you. Absolutely. Lovely to be on your show. Thank you for inviting me. And, Corey, uh, lovely to have met you in Prague. That was great, Steve. We have to do that What's again. Just? <laughs> just? Well, I just want to sort of clear up the, the details. I've got a lot of people in England who really backstabbed me over what happened. There's a lot of them say that I'm a fraud and things. So let's just clear that out. I had a motorcycle accident when I was 20, um, and through that accident I had to have a blood transfusion. And many years later, around about 1993, I had to have a routine blood test for something, and my bloods were showing a bit wrong. They further developed it and said that I had cirrhosis of the liver due to alcohol. And I said, uh, problem, I don't actually drink. <laughs> so he went, oh, <laughs> no, you're lying. I said, no. <laughs> anyway, they've done some further tests, and I had a biopsy, and one of the, the best surgeons in the world at the time, from St. George's Hospital, I can't remember his name. Anyway, he, 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 he decided that it was hepatitis C, it was the start of paper, and that hepatitis C was in the liver. And one of the obvious places that I would have got it from was a tainted batch of blood, because at that time, when I had the accident, tainted blood was coming in to the UK from America. It was being sold by the prison down in Arkansas. Um, there's a whole story behind that, what I won't get into. Anyway, to cut a long story short, basically, uh, I had, at the age of, I can't quite, oh, sorry, I'm not really good at time scales, but I sort of had a kid and a house and a business, and I had hep C, but I felt fine. I thought, well, we, we, they, they offered me some treatment then, which was an experimental treatment. I refused and sort of, I said, well, what's going to happen? They said, well, you're going to get to about 50, 60, if you're lucky, and then it really will kick in. And I thought, well, look, hold on a minute. And if I take the treatment, they said, well, it's a year on a treatment. It's really bad. So I just did one of those things, but I'm okay today. I've got a mortgage of company and blah, blah, blah. I'll deal with this a bit later down the line. Well, unfortunately... 2010 later down the line finally hit me yeah so steve did you have did you have any uh symptoms during that uh period where you decided to do it later well uh, i actually believed at the time no i didn't have symptoms but now on hepatitis c clear i can see that i had a lot of symptoms but you see because i had it from the age of 2021 and it's very insidious hepatitis C. It creeps up on you day by day. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah. So I sort of thought I put it down to tired and stress and everything else that you can ever put things down to. But now I realize that the hepatitis C is gone. I had a lot of problems with it. But I, I didn't think so. I thought I was doing okay. Yeah? Yeah. And it wasn't until I got to sort of mid-50s um, 2009 and 2000, oh, God, I was so tired all the time. I'm so miserable and I had no energy and oh, everything was, yeah. And then, as I say, one day I just basically really collapsed. I went into the, I said to my, my wife at the time, I said, I really don't feel very well, you know. <laughs> and then he anyway, that evening I went into the bathroom to be sick and I threw up. The first lot was about two kilos of blood. Um, and about five minutes later, I threw up about another kilo and a half, and I'd done that three times. I thought I was actually going to die that night over the bar. Anyway, they rushed me into hospital, and they said, listen, mate, your hepatitis has gone boof, and it's now eating your liver away, and you've got varicoses in there, and you've got cirrhosis of the liver, and blah, blah, blah. And I said, oh, <laughs> what are we going to do? And they said, well, the only thing we can offer you is a treatment for the hepatitis C which is a course of over 11 months. You inject yourself once a week. It's caused interferon. There's lots of people that are out there, Sue Rosen, for instance, and that guy down from Tennessee. Right, there's lots of Hep C people that listen in, right? They all know about this. Interferon, my God, that's a, if, you, if you can survive interferon, you, su you survive a nuclear bomb. What was that like? Right. It was terrible. It was worse than death. It's a yeah. form of chemotherapy, isn't it? 
It's a four, yeah, it's a poison, basically, it's a rat poison they put inside your body and you lose your nails and your hair, you lose your mind, you get a chemo, oh, it's just really good, and you just watch yourself falling to heartbeat, but you carry on, it's an 11 month treatment, and if you survive it, you've got a fairly 50-50 sort of chance of actually getting rid of the hair. Very few people can actually get through the whole course, quite a few of them die on the way, and unfortunately... A, a very large percentage of them, even when they've done it, still doesn't cure the hepatitis C. Did you take? Well, did on, you do the full eleven months? Well, I done. I done virtually. There was fifty. Oh God, how many? There was fifty-one injections, and I done fifty of them. And on the morning of the fifty-one, which was the last one, I don't know, God, you know, I used to get up in the morning. You take it once a week. I used to get up in the morning about four o'clock and take it because. Then I used to go back to bed. I used to do it on a Wednesday. And then I was really sick for Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Saturday, I'd sort of revive a little bit. And then I might get a sort of Sunday and a Monday and a Tuesday, which were not too bad. And then it's back into this routine again of going really down the bottom. Anyway, I woke up this Wednesday morning. It was my last injection. And I was due an appointment at the hospital. And for some reason, I didn't put that injection inside of myself that morning. I thought, I'm going to wait until I get to the hospital. Well, I wonder why I managed... Why did you decide not to do it? Any idea? Well, I don't really know. I'm bloody glad I did because if I had put that injection inside of myself, I would have been dead on the floor that morning then and now. Because when I got to the hospital and they done some routine tests like they normally done, they basically shifted me straight onto an isolation ward. Right. And after six hours on an isolation ward, the top guy came in and he said, I'm sorry, Mr. Danks. He said, you know, your liver's collapsing. There's not much we can do. You most probably won't last 48 hours more. Yikes. So be it. Okay. Well, I was okay with it, to be honest with you. you, know, well, you probably felt so crappy. I, I did. I, I really did. I, I had a year of it. I fought my best fight. I had a bad life. I was only about, what, 56. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'd accepted it. I, I really couldn't carry on like that no more. So you're in the so, ho- you're in the hospital. They tell you you mm. have 48 hours to live. What mm. what was what happened next? Well, they the basically I didn't die. <laughs> 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 but by everybody's surprise, I didn't quite die. I sort of came back. I revived a little bit. And they got me out. I, I went in the hospital on the on the first of December. Um, it's uh, five years ago this December, mm-hmm. and they discharged me on the twenty first of December. I didn't feel good, but I was alive and I'd finished the course. Then you have to wait three months to find out if it's cured the Hep C. Mm-hmm. So three months went past. So we get to about March, and I went to the hospital to the results. I was alive, but I was feeling more like about 80. I don't know what it feels like to feel 80. I mean, it's a disrespect to say I felt like 80, but I really did feel very old, very weak. I had no hair. I had very – my nails had finished. I was very small. I was very confused. I, I, you know, I wasn't in a good state. I was alive. You, you had know, a heartbeat. Still, still there. Yeah, I was still there. Still going. Anyway, in the doctor's office, he said, well, Mr. Danks, he said, you, you've cleared the hepatitis C. Wow! You know, all right, I've cleared that. I saw that I'll get my health back. And he said, well, unfortunately, he said, your liver's gone into end-stage cirrhosis. Oh, right. So he gave me good news on one hand and took it away with the other hand. So I walked out of the office. I thought, right, what are we going to do now? <laughs> now? This is the embarrassing bit, okay? I've been working with agricultural hemp since 1993. And I've sort of been around cannabis since I was sort of 20 years old up in the Himalayan Mountains. And I'd watched Rick Simpson's video. I'd even handed it out to a load of people. But I hadn't used it, not during the course of treatment that I was on. And I thought, right, now is the time. Let's go and give this cannabis stuff a go. (laughs) (laughs) So I took myself home, made myself some oil, and started putting it in. Great. Well, this is okay. I, I, I started to get better. I was seeing aliens and talking to myself, but I couldn't go out. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, but like, I was okay. I'm getting better. And about sort of six months went past, uh, and I had another couple of blood tests, and they were looking quite good. But I still wasn't right. 
And I thought, oh, I'll tell you what I'm going to go and do. I'll watch some of that William Courtney stuff, the raw juicing. And I'd been involved in raw food and raw juicing. It just sort of... I thought, well, the RSO's got me this far. I'm going to take myself off to India now and do some raw juicing. If that don't work, I'm going to have a bottle of brandy, a load of pills, and watch the sunset and go to the beach. Because I can't really live like this. You know, I better not. So I got myself to India and I started raw juicing it. Oh, my God. That's, that really kicked in. All of a sudden, by using the whole full plant in its raw state, my liver just totally accepted it. And that's when the regeneration started. And you don't get high when you uh, uh, raw juice, do you? No, you don't, actually. Uh, more's a pity sometimes. But, <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, I mean, I don't have a problem with really getting high. But obviously, there is benefits to not being completely out of your brain because you can, st- you know, like mothers that have got children or some people do need to work, you know. There is certain responsibility being completely off your face that you can't do. Mm-hmm. And because mine was down to really liver regeneration, I could have lived quite happily completely stoned out of my head for the rest of my life. I personally wouldn't have had a problem with that. But I, I just wanted to try this. And raw juicing was fine. How much juice did you take and a day, I Steve? I always felt that because when I use, well, I'll, I'll get back to that. When I, sure. when I used, because I still used to smoke, there's something about THC that affects the liver when you've got hepatitis C in it or cirrhosis. It sort of, it, it just goes literally to the brain. The smallest amount sends you completely nuts. And for some reason, it doesn't actually, it, it will cure what the problem is, but it don't actually regenerate it. What I found out by the raw juicing, it actually regenerates it. And, and the, my medical proof has proven that. So again, it's all these things we're learning about this plant and what works for one person, maybe not works for the next person. But honestly, you know, RSO is a great way forward, and so is raw juicing. And maybe you have to use a combo of both of them. It's finding out what works for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah? And for me, RSO got me from the hospital, if you like, to a plane ticket to India. And in India, the raw juicing got me up and running. And after three months, I came back to England. And I really got stuck in. I was getting up doing yoga, raw juicing all day long, not just all, all food. Really, really. You know, once you get a bite for life, you grab it. Yeah? Mm-hmm. And I felt that life force return in my body. So I really did grab it. I basically locked myself away. I didn't go out. I didn't want to see anybody. I just wanted to do my routine. Steve, how long so, um, after you started uh, juicing did you begin to notice a difference? Ah, that was interesting. Three days. Yeah. Three days, eh? Three days. Three days. Seriously. And Steve, <laughs> getting back to the earlier question, how much yeah. juice did you did you take a day? As much as I could. So we're we talking like three glasses, six glasses. Well, being in India, I had access to the plant. So I, I reckon I, mm-hmm. I, see, I never, unfortunately, I never took a lot of notice of how much I was taking. Mm, you just kind of were going yeah. through the motions yeah. and doing yeah, like, it. Like, get it in, I feel good, get some more in. I reckon I was doing about, plant-wise, at least 100 grams a day of fresh bud and leaf. Mm, okay. And in India, that, that was easy to get in India, was it? Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I can imagine uh, if you're if you're on uh, death's doorstep, uh, you'll do whatever it takes in order oh, absolutely. to... absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's like, why not? You got, there's nothing else to do. Mm-hmm. There's, only, okay. there's only one door open, and that's called Mr. Death, and there's a little glimmer of light down another path. You've got to go down it, yeah? And, and, as I say, I know cannabis wasn't going to kill me. And I thought, well, I'll push as much of it as I can inside of me. And anyway, taking it forward from there... Once I came back and I had a lot of help, I'd been sort of really travelling for the last two and a half years. I've been to Jamaica and I've been to Spain and I've been to Greece, I've been to Romania. So I've had access to lots of different stocks and I've used it in every way that you can possibly think. I stuck it up in my bum, I had a shaman turn it into a snuff so I could snort it, I stuck it in my ears, I fracked it, RSO'd it, raw juiced it. Baked it, cooked it, <laughs> made tea with it. <laughs> and my opinion is, really, at the end of the day, which is not really scientific, use as much as you can and use it fresh and keep it organic. That's the best way. Yeah, that's excellent. 
That's good to hear. Have you uh, had any contact with your doctors back in the UK? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We we went back to see doctor um, after I came back from India, and he gave me the all clear. That was quite interesting. And I went to his office, and they done the blood test. I said, how am I doing? I was actually sort of... Last time he saw me, I was on a Zimmer frame, by the way. I was on a walking frame uh, with a bag, so I can put my poo in it and stuff like that. I was sort of bounced into his office. I was looking all fit and healthy and been doing yoga. So one, he was actually surprised to see me, and two, he was a bit shocked at my state of health. But once he got the medical bits back, he said to me, I said, how am I doing? He said, you're doing okay. I said, well, as a consultant, you know, can we bring that up a little bit? Uh, Okay means... (laughs) So I said, right, the liver. I had, last time I saw you, I had end stage cirrhosis of the liver. How's the liver doing? He said, oh, it's fine. So it was all regenerated. I had three big, ba- I had four and a half barricades in my vein, which is like blood vessels that are all split and they have to band them. I said, how are they doing? He said, well, how are they? He said, you've got one little, well, well he said, you've got a bit of one left. He said, well, I won't worry about it. He said, all the other ones have all disappeared. Well, oh, blood counts, fine. Right, right, yeah. Oh, he said, fine, he said, you're healthy. So I said, in medical terms then, I said, what would you call that? He said, well, in medical terms, that's what we call a miracle. <laughs> 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 and I said, well, actually, mister, I said, you've been the liver specialist and all that, right? And you've just admitted to me that you've never seen nothing like that. I said, I'd like you to put on my medical notes that that's what cannabis did. And he said, well, I can't put you down as a cannabis user. I said, they're my medical notes. You put whatever I want on there. He said, no, the only thing I legally can put is that you're a cannabis abuser. I said, that's <sighs> fine by me. You put me down as cannabis abuser. Because if, if this is abuse, I'm up for it. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it on, yeah. So anyway, then I said to him, I said, let's get back to this miracle thing. I said, well, that's... I said, we've got a slight problem here. And he looked at me strange. He said, what's that? I said, well, it was a miracle. I said, you're a Muslim, and I'm David who's born a Christian. So which God was it that caused the miracle? Was it your God that <laughs> hadn't treated me in the last three months? Or was it my God that I called Ganja Jar as the far right? <laughs> he just started laughing. <laughs> but I did, I'll give you one thing, right? He sent me my medical notes for about a month later. And he actually put on there, cannabis user. Oh, and I wow. think that is the first time in the UK that anybody's been put down as cannabis user and not cannabis abuser. Good. So he did, you know, he went a little bit there for me, bless him. <laughs> <laughs> not enough, but, uh, you know, as every step in the right direction is a step in the right direction. Is uh, medical cannabis legal in the UK? Uh, medical ca- no cannabis is legal in the medical in the UK except for this stuff made by GW Pharmaceuticals. Yeah. So otherwise, no, 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 no. There's no such thing as medical cannabis in the UK. It's all illegal, totally illegal. But they do have this company that produces a cannabis-based medicine called Sabitex, which is made by a company called GW Pharmaceuticals, which is owned by a lot of members of the government. They're all making millions and millions of pounds out of it, and it also works out at just over one hundred pounds per gram. <laughs> you think you've been ripped off from a pot dealer? A hundred pounds per gram. Wow. That's about one hundred and twenty dollars, by the way. Wow. One gram. That's crazy. And all it is is cannabis bathed in alcohol. That's all it is. Now, where you are in Transylvania, mm. what uh, what are the the laws there with respect to the use of cannabis? Well, we're interested. One, I love it because I've come back home, in a sense, to work with agricultural hemp, which I really do love. That's where my professional ship is, and that's the one that really excites me, even though medical cannabis, whatever you want to call it, cannabis food, because I don't, I don't actually even like the term medical cannabis because it's all medical, but it's really it's food, and the food feeds the endocannabinoid system, mm-hmm. and the endocannabinoid system kicks in and that repairs us. So we need this food to feed our endocannabinoid system. So, but we stay with medical cannabis. I work with agricultural hemp, which I really love, and here it's not only legal, it's revered, and it's one of the best hemp growing nations in the world, and it never stopped. Medical cannabis is actually legal here in Romania and is one of the first countries to go legal a long, long time ago, but we got no access to it. <laughs> Which I'm working on, okay? So, what was that about access? You have no access to it? 
No, there's no, there's no doctor that'll write you a prescription for it, and even if he wrote you a prescription for it, there's no way you can actually buy it. <laughs> okay, so, so you just love cannabis. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody has to go underground if they're looking to obtain that. Is that it? Yeah, or? pretty much so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But at least we have the law in place. We're not trying to change the law. We're just trying to get the law activated. Yeah, working properly. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> Steve, when you tell uh, people your story and you run into skeptics, do they yeah. discount what you say? They just they believe that somehow it was the interferon that helped you and not the cannabis? Well, the interferon definitely cured the hepatitis C. Yeah. I don't have a problem with that. Mm-hmm. What, cured the, what cured the end-stage liver? cirrhosis yeah well i took no pills from the medical profession so it's you've got two choices it was what that doctor said it's a it's a miracle so i've been touched by the man upstairs i don't i can't i can live with that or the or, or the woman scientifically, upstairs typically i would go that is 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 the cannabis or the cannabinoids inside of the cannabis plant that seems more practical but you can believe which one you want i really don't mind the interesting thing is that if you had taken that one last dose of interferon you might not be here today I really don't know. Nobody, not even the doctor said, said, good job you did take that last one. <laughs> but uh, seriously, it was on the verge. It was virtually, it was collapsing. Yeah, but... It you... really, it was on last legs that morning. I only had to stick one more jab in there, mate. Yeah. And it was gone. Yeah, interesting how the intuition tells you uh, what not to do or what to do, and uh, you you followed your intuition. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's always my advice to anybody that sells well. Follow your own gut feeling. What feels good for you, that's your right medicine. Have you worked with other uh, patients with cirrhosis of the liver? Yeah. And how are they doing? Pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah are- I've worked with quite a few people across all sorts of things. Because I, I, I basically boil the plant down in water. <laughs> and that, that I do get a lot of flack over. Yeah, I take a whole plant, boil it down in water, and make up a paste from it, so it's full spectrum. I've had great success with that. So tell us how you do that. You boil it, and it it uh, turns into kind of a mush. Well, there's a recipe in the Bible in Exodus, and right. it tells you how Jesus done it. So I basically copied his recipe, and it sort of works. Is that the one that's got the myrrh and stuff in it too? Yeah, you can put more frankincense in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I've yeah. seen that. Yeah, but it's the actual methodology. You see, as well, also, you see, before I got really sick, I had a hemp company that was dealing in cosmetics. We used to make really nice hemp quality cosmetics. So some of the practices that I saw in that recipe are not unfamiliar to me because they're used in the cosmetics industry. Okay. Uh, so when I actually read that, I thought, mm, hold on a minute. Uh, <laughs> so we sort of developed another method. I'm, I'm about to go. I'm just waiting for a big lab report to come back, actually. Then I'll go really public with it. But anecdotal evidence, some of the people that I've been giving this to is like, oh, Jesus, literally Jesus Christ, this stuff works. Yeah. But I've got to refine it a bit more. I've got to do a bit more work with it. I've certainly got to get a lab report behind it from a, a lab that's respected. I'm not going to tell you what lab is tested it for me, but it's one in America, and I've got one over here in the Balkans, which is a university. So uh, I'm on, it should hopefully be sometime this week. And if the lab comes back with what sort of matches what we think it could be, then I think we've got a really good new method to go in conjunction with some of the other methods that we've found, like vaping it and RSO and all these other marvelous methods for ingesting or suppositories. Yeah? It's just another way of doing it. Another way of and of course, it makes it a lot cheaper because I'm working... Also, I work in the low THC and high CBDs and not the high THC, which makes it very functional for a lot of people because they can take it, and as we said earlier... They're not going to get stowed out of their brains. Yeah. They can still function. When we talk about the low THC and the high CBD, Mm. are you using the hemp plant? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, what is commonly known as the hemp plant really is the distinction by the United Nations when they done that 1967 thing. They said anything that was below 0.3 THC became in the category of agricultural hemp. And anything over 0.3 became a really dangerous drug. That will kill you. People would <laughs> kill people and be lazy and smell and stuff like that. Will so create murder. Uh, it sounds like alcohol, isn't it? 
<laughs> so, Steve, when you were talking about how you've been giving that to people and they've been saying, oh, it really works, what kind of uh, conditions do they have? Are you talking about a whole spectrum I've of conditions? I've had great success with breast cancer. I've had great success with leukemia. Reasonable success with epilepsy. Oh, yeah, they've been a bit... Uh, hmm. Yeah, epilepsy's mm-hmm. a bit... Yeah. So it's always helped, but some of it not not as good as some of these these ones that are cut, you know, like Ailey's Open or that, or that what mm-hmm. that Jason Cranford's doing. They're getting great success. Right. Me, I'm a bit hit and miss with it, or I don't quite, you know, I'll get 80% reduction. Or, yeah, not quite fixed with that one, but certainly breast cancer, certainly leukemia, skin cancer, and burns. Well, just put it on and watch them disappear. Here, yeah. They go overnight. Yeah. yeah. Can I ask you about the breast cancers? Because I'm always on this quest with this hormone-driven stuff. With the hormone-driven, are you, when you're saying you have great success with the, the breast cancers, are they the triple negatives or are they the hormone-driven ones? Well, I've had success with both of them. And funny okay. enough, I was talking to Dr. Bob when we were in Prague about this. Right. And I can't explain what he said to me. <laughs> Welcome to the club. <laughs> <laughs> he explained to me why it is he thinks my one works on both of them. And I actually understood him, but I can't repeat it because you know what Dr. Bob's like. And he hit me at about 2 o'clock in the morning. Right? And he went blah, 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 blah. And I went, oh, my God. And the next day when I tried to get him to repeat it, he said, I can't remember what I told you. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, as far as Bob was concerned, there is a good scientific reason. But yeah, again, with that, 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 that thing, hormone positive hormone. Yeah, with the THC, it gets a bit weird, doesn't it? But my one, because he's only got this low THC, and it seems to do it. I, I, we're early days. Yeah, yeah. Early yeah. Days. yeah. Chemia's been very good. That's the same yeah. Thing, yeah. It's fascinating, uh, over the last number of years, the the public knowledge of the use of cannabis, or hemp, high THC, CBD, the cannabinoid system, how people are starting to understand that far quicker than the medical profession. Tell me about it. Yeah. I mean, seriously, I'm, I'm a better liver specialist, because one again, I was medically trained from the age of... Uh, 18 to the age of 21, I was, I was a trained nurse. So I got a sort of medical background, and my father was a medic, and my sisters were, right? So I come from a sort of like medical background and family. But I tell you, I think I know more about liver these days than the liver specialist that I was under. Because I've cured more than him. Good for you. So, and I sort of know how my liver works, so I had to learn about how my liver works. Because I had a problem with my liver. Mm-hmm. So I think you're exactly right. Most people that I meet, once they get involved in this cannabis, they, they really sort of understand. And why the, the medical profession just can't get the basics of this? Well, it only leaves one thing, doesn't it? The corrupt. It's the only thing. They're leaving the, the, themselves wide open for, for refusing to sort of understand something that somebody like myself can understand to the point of I can even sit with you know I, I love talking you know, I'm going to mention Bob again Dr. Robert I can sit and have a decent conversation with a man like Robert Melamita I can sit with an oncologist and have a decent conversation with them mm-hmm. and I, I'm not you know I'm, I'm no brain of Britain <laughs> <laughs> I'm not university trained or anything like that I'm a commoner but you can get your head around it. It gets complicated, but it's also quite simple. It's basically, it's a plant, grows in the ground, grows anywhere. High THC, low THC. There's, in fact, there's only two types of plant on the planet of cannabis. There's a male cannabis plant and a female cannabis plant. After that, it's reproduction, just like humans. That's right. Two humans. There's a female human and a male human. After that, we're all shapes and sizes and all different colours. And every time we breed, we breed a different one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so all this, yeah, we got sativas, we got indicas, and we got ruderances, and we got this percentage of THC and that percentage of THC. Yeah, but they're just the same family. What we do as humans is we try and complicate things far too much. Don't we just? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Don't we just? Uh, yeah, but I know. I think it makes us look clever. <laughs> exactly. I mean, your your uh, your characterization of, of cannabis is right. There's a male plant and a female plant. That's and, it. And uh, they both have benefits. Yeah, they both have benefits. 
Especially the female, I've right? The world, look at these plants, and that's the only two types of different plants that I've really ever seen: a male plant and a female plant. Yeah, I've seen tall ones, short ones, fat ones, but as I say that's like people. You don't see two people the same. You virtually won't find. In fact, if you find two cannabis plants that look exactly the same, I'd run away from them. Because that means they're super GM hybrid things. GMO, yeah. It don't grow like that. And I've been, I've been in hectares and acres of it. You won't find two plants. The same. So, Steve, do you now live in uh, Romania, Transylvania? Sort of, yeah. I've, I've been transitory for the last two and a half years, but I've decided to try and make this my own. I love it here. Yeah, I heard it's very beautiful. Oh, yeah, man. It's not, yeah, it is. It's nice. And I love this old. I, I love the Balkans. I, 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 yeah, I, I love the history here. Yeah, lots of things. It's, um, it's The Balkans are nice. Yeah. yeah. Well, Steve, and, of course, we're surrounded by countries that are all going legal. Czechoslovakia is legal. Yeah, uh, where we was in Prague. Uh, Corey will remember we, we all sat in a restaurant on, on the first evening. And after a nice meal, and it was just a normal, nice restaurant, everybody on the table just skinned up a spliff and went outside and smoked it. And nobody, nobody even bats an eyelid. Yeah? No. It's just the most common thing to do. It's yeah. Like, so we're living, uh, we're not that far from Ireland and Germany's gone legal, you know. So we're sort of in a nice region of legality. Here's a question for you, Steve. Do you know the country that consumes the most cannabis? I would say it's most probably America at the moment. Well, you're close. Iceland. According to the UN, uh, 18% of Icelanders, uh, I shouldn't say smoke, no. but consume, consume uh, no, marijuana. that can't be right. I know Icelanders. They have real problems getting it. Super, oh, well, that's... Super expensive. The U.S. is 16.2%. Uh, Nigeria is just over 14 And Canada is close to 13%. Surely, population per head has got to be Jamaica. Yeah, Jamaica is way down there, and uh, no, I lived yeah. in Jamaica. Seriously, everybody, <laughs> everybody's into it. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I got to tell you, I do get. I've certainly had um, a number of calls from people in Iceland that are actually on oil. Yeah, yeah. Maybe they're just quieter about it. I don't know. But I was surprised, well, too. Well, I'll tell you what, they've got a very short growing season outdoors. <laughs> you think? <laughs> Don't they ever? <laughs> <laughs> That's one thing for sure. <laughs> on, on this list, this UN list, Jamaica is number 22. Maybe it's the people you were hanging out with in Jamaica. I was hanging out with Rastafarian community. <laughs> oh, well, no <laughs> wonder. Say no more. <laughs> That's right. If you don't get up and smoke a spliff in the morning, nobody talks to you. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you'd like to say in conclusion? Yeah, actually, I'm going to name drop a little bit, right? Uh, can't just pull this screen up. We've got a big, nice thing happening in England. There's a, right, I just want to do this for this guy. Just bear with me one minute, man. Sure. Right, they've worked so hard at this. I don't normally name drop other people, but this is important. They've made a film. It's an independent filmmaker. It's basically it's UK-based. We're having a lot of trouble in the UK over this cannabis stuff um we've got the highest cancer rates in europe most probably the world at the moment and this guy's doing a really really nice job man and now they they, they, they what's it they're doing that funding thing on it and anyway in three days time it closes they needed to raise forty thousand. they've raised thirty one thousand. so in three days they need another nine thousand. it's called the cancer conflict you can find them on facebook oh yeah, view the facebook page right facebook it's the Cancer Conflict, at The Cancer Conflict. Please go and check them out. If you can give them a dollar or a pound, they're so close to finishing this, really. And the guys, the, the team that have been behind it have really put their heart and soul into it. It's fantastic. Thanks for having me on. Um, and I'll get you on my show sometime. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, no. I've been trying to get Corey on my show for about a year. Okay. All right. Oh, no. I owe you. <laughs> you owe me one now. I do. Anyway, lovely to speak to you all. Huh? You take care now. Okay. You too, Steve. Thank you so much. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, one love, one love, one love. One love. Okay. Bye-bye. That was Steve Danks speaking to us from Transylvania, actually. Transylvania is a region in Romania, and it's best known as the mysterious land of bloodthirsty vampires, howling wolves, and, of course, Dracula. Just before we sign off, just a reminder, if you'd like us to continue with these podcasts, 
please go to our website, CannabisHealthRadio.com, and make a pledge. The donation can be big or small, a one-time donation, or a monthly donation, whatever you like. All donations are gratefully appreciated. Help us in our mission to help others. You've been listening to the Cannabis Health Radio podcast. Visit our website, CannabisHealthRadio.com, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.